We're just outside Beijing, that's Peking as it used to be of course, with 133 cars that are about to embark on a bit of an adventure. It's the famous Peking to Paris race and the only other time it was rerun 10 years ago, it was too much of an adventure and two drivers died. This time, no one imagines it's going to be easy, but they've paid £35,000 per car to be here. There are nearly 8,000 miles ahead, some of them with no roads at all, and it's going to get a lot tougher than most people are expecting. They've all been inspired by an epoch-marking event that began close to here 100 years ago because in 1907, a Paris newspaper challenged anyone to cross two continents by motor car. It would be revolutionary. It would prove that the automobile was a serious means of transport which might open up the world. Far from splendid, the roads were all twists and turns. Cars had no brakes to speak of, no cover, no windscreens even. So to race from Peking to Paris in one of these contraptions, when half the route had no roads, you had to be crazy. But the Italian Prince Borghese, with his seven-litre Atala, took up the challenge and headed into the Gobi Desert in a race against four other madmen. They were Marco Polos on wheels, they were Edwardian astronauts, and four of them would actually make it to Paris, where a band played the Grand March from Aida. They did the impossible, they inspired generations of adventurers, and a Hollywood movie too, The Great Race. In the film, the bad guys do their worst, but inevitably the prize and the girl finally go to the good guy, Tony Curtis. We're going to be following some good guys now on the lawless road to Paris. There are the Geordie lads, they'll be taking a lot of punishment. It's not a rally, it's an ordeal. I can't believe it, it's a destruction testing of men and cars. Driving hard and shopping harder, there's Michelle. How does that look? Never taking things too seriously, we have the Atala boys. There are the Aussies. We've got to talk about that really good looking Mongolian border guard. She was hot. She was hot. And we have the two fast ladies. Stop! I do, Jack, yeah. Very confident indeed. Well, because I'm going to borrow your Land Rover and you're going in this. <laughs> Shouldn't be a problem for me on that basis. In your dreams, Jonathan, I like cars with windscreens. Just like the Tour de France, the rally will stop every night and every morning the competing will start again. The buccaneering character who made this whole extravaganza happen is Philip Young. Three years of work have gone into this, and now the day is dawn. Isn't it fantastic? It's a terrific atmosphere. Now the cars are actually rolling. So finally, we're on the road. There he goes, piggyback on a 100-year-old horseless carriage. Thousands of miles to go, with 133 drivers, all aiming to relive Borghese's epic drive. Now it's time to try to explain something which is really quite complicated, and that is how the competition is actually run. First of all, there are three classes of car. We're in the classic class because our car is pre-1961. Hi. We're in the classics category because the car, Sunbeam Rapier, is pre-1961. We're in the vintage class, which is for vehicles built prior to 1941. We're in the vintage class because our car is pre-1941. We're in the Pioneer class because this car was built in pre-1921. So there are three classes of car, and there are also three grades of medal that anybody can win, bronze, silver, and gold. And then there is the points system beyond that, which decides who wins in each class and who wins overall. And that is really complicated. 
At the end of every day, the rally staff get together and cook the books. And then they put the results up on the notice board, and everybody marvels. Well, the gold medals, I believe, I mean, if you start every day on time and you visit the time controls and you attempt a, a, um, a time trial, then, uh, then you'll be right. You're still eligible for gold. If you miss out on any of those daily starts or daily finishes or a time trial, if you want to bypass that, then you, you go down one peg. That's my understanding. But you can still be the leader of your class. You can still be the leader. Makes sense? Well, it's all down to it's all down to the timing. And, and in, in the Olympics, sure. the gold medal goes to the person who comes first. That's usually. the one. Yeah. <laughs> A bit confusing. At the wheel of this 1930s Chevrolet is the girl they call the baby driver. Michelle's a New Yorker, a very petite one, as she found out when she went buying clothes for the trip. I went to all the camping stores, and unfortunately, they don't make clothing for small people. Uh, apparently, small people don't camp. And so uh, I had to find things that fit. So that ended up being in the children's section. Um, and oddly, uh, I wore a children's medium, which was surprising. Um, and apparently, I'm built like a 10-year-old girl. Car number two is a 1907 Itala, a rather botched version of Prince Borghese's more powerful car. Jonathan and Adam, the Itala boys, did the 1997 peaking to Paris, and they know each other all too well. I've done my hair, my teeth are clean. Uh, this is Jonathan Turner, and uh, I'm in an Itala with Adam Hartley, and I'm about to introduce you to Adam, who has got a packing problem. Adam has overpacked. The problem is, Jonathan, as you well know, I like a tidy car. And you are not a tidy person. No. So why am I doing this rally with you? I don't know. The fact is, we do not have enough room to put these two monstrous black bags that you bought. Hello, camera on me, please. Oh, sorry. I was just exhibit A. <laughs> <laughs> these two big black bags that you have bought, uh, full of kit, plus all the stuff that we need for the rally. Gloves, hats, goggles, sunglasses, rain gear, extra layers of clothing. We uh, plus Snow a tent. suit, skis. Tent. Tent. We've got a tent to put in the car. Fondue set, bridge Hello. freezer. Just like 10 years ago, I'm in a Land Rover, dead reliable and as British as roast beef. When Prince Borghese and the others came through this way 100 years ago, just getting out of Peking to the north, it was a hell of a slog. They took two days to get up through here because these were mountains, there was no motorway like this, and in fact, as this picture shows, they actually had to be hauled up by teams of men. The Model T Ford was never built for going uphill. In 1907, there were teams of coolies to give you a push. Now it's do-it-yourself. Two days later, the Model T Ford was finished and out of the rally. And now, only an hour into the race, Jonathan and Adam, the Atala boys, are having their first spot of bother. So that was on there like that. We went over a bump, 
the wheel, just like it did in the car park at our hotel the other day, hit here, caught on these bolts, and ripped it under there. Lucky so we've it taken it off. What do you think about these cars? Um, my name is Gong Xue. Uh-huh. Uh. You, you speak English, good English. Uh, thank you, thank you. Yeah, yeah, welcome. Do you like the cars? Uh, yes, I like. The two fast ladies are in a Sunbeam Rapier, car 118, that one. It's their first time in China, Pamela and Nicola. The local people have been lining the streets waving at us, and both me and Pamela feel quite choked and emotional about it. It is an amazing sight that these people are lining the streets just to wave us good luck. I'm quite surprised about how emotional an experience it is. I'm not known for getting choked up, but I was quite choked. Outside the town, some cars are in trouble, the Atala boys are going well, and Dan and Michelle are stopped. The car does not seem to like the mountains. Uh, I, it's a minor problem. Um, we had it at 40, and I think we were pushing it a little bit. We broke down. We, we started to overheat just down there. You don't think we bothered them? No, it's going to happen. It's a lovely place. We have the police here, if need be. I'm searching around for champagne to no avail, but nonetheless, yeah, it's beautiful. The weather's nice, it's quite relaxing. We have lovely green velvet seats to recline in, and uh, it'll get back down. It'll be fine. We'll make it. If you can't fix it and the backup mechanics can't, then you're on your own. Do what? Do what? He's calling the rally's local fixer. Not a lot of help. There, there's, there isn't a hope leader. Not a hope. There's no, there's no one around here except the mechanics. Why? There's, there is no, there is no, um, there's nothing. It's just open countryside. Uh, she's saying just summer lift. Tony Folks is one of the rally's ace mechanics. I mean, that's pretty sound advice, actually, and as the lorries come down here, it's certainly Somewhere worth trying to slow one down, and maybe you can get one to stop. I've done it before. Yeah, and what are you going to do when you get them to stop? Well, you get them to help you and pay them to take your car to the next town. And how do we do that? Well, so here's one coming now, so that's, uh, you know, we never know. Um, it's so quite amazing Lina. what you can do at the side of the road. Trucks are not stopping today, and it's sinking in that this is not a package tour. The Atala boys are back in the race. Up ahead, some cars have already reached tonight's stopping place at the regional capital, Datong. One car which has done well today is the Sunbeam Rapier, driven by Pamela Reed. <laughs> <laughs> We've just arrived at Daytong Hotel and we were really absolutely thrilled because we were owned, our due time was 17.42 and I ran down here because somebody had uh, blocked the entrance, they'd broken down. Sorry, I will remove my glasses so you can see my eyes. <laughs> they'd uh, broken down here, so what I did, as I said to Nicholas, whatever you do, stay with the car and I'm going to leg it into the hotel. So ran into the hotel and we made it for 17.44, so two minutes late. There are plenty of men drivers with women navigators, but only two all-woman crews. Pamela and Nicola are one of those. Has Nicola had a nice day? Yes, really good, and I got to drive from the Hanging Monastery to the finish of t t for today. So I had a really good time. It's the first time I've ever driven in a rally. And, um, <laughs> <laughs> and she did really, actually. <laughs> she did really, really well. Adam, your hair looks great. Uh, this is your first day in Datong. You drove here. How do you feel? Well, it's clear that we underestimated exactly what was uh, going to be required on this trip. I'll say. <laughs> and I think the first sign of that was how cold it was this morning and the constant wind and noise in your ears and the constant uh, buffeting from the car. 
no windscreen, no doors. It's pretty cold. Cars that haven't made it to Datong yet are passing by fields where the main crop seems to be coal. With her coal-fired power stations, China is rated the world's top polluter. But you couldn't exactly call our gas-guzzling old cars green, could you? Ah, oh, well, this car is particularly green because we fitted it with a CVE unit, which is a calorific value enhancement unit, um, which uh, improves fuel efficiency and reduces emissions. Also, what we've done with our sponsor, Enesol, which is an energy management company, is um, we've got them to, via CarbonClear, www.carbonclear.com, <laughs> um, to offset all our emissions for the entire trip. So, in fact, our trip is entirely green. By driving across. China, you're making the world a better place. Yes, and we're also raising money for Save the Children. Impeccable. <laughs> it's my halo there. What about the Atala boys? How do they feel about polluting the planet? Right, we're in um, the coal capital of this coal producing region, and China is the leading polluter of the world. How green are we? Well, you're asking the wrong guy. I used to sell coal for a living, so I actually love this stuff. Coal is actually quite an efficient fuel these days, if you uh, burn it correctly, which I'm less sure the Chinese are doing. And we're going through with all these big engines popping out of uh, A reasonable amount of CO2, but it is all in the, in the name of fun. Whereas the Chinese power stations are in the name of energy and wealth creation. We're just absolutely being totally irresponsible. <laughs> Somebody needed to say that. Oh, <laughs> yep, we're just Mr. Toads going poop poop in faraway places. Tonight we're in a hotel, but in the Gobi Desert it will be tents and sleeping bags. Not everyone is looking forward to that. Michelle likes nice cotton sheets. And what matters, apparently, is that they have a high thread count. Hotels seem to be in an increasing downward spiral. Um, and I anticipate it's only going to get worse from here. We have actual sheets tonight, so that's a plus. Last night they had a high thread count. Tonight, uh, it's a little not unlike sandpaper, but um, at least we have sheets and a mattress. And tomorrow night I hear rumors of a yurt. Um, even if you don't know what a yurt is, you can tell it's, it's not good. In a room along the corridor, the Atala boys are finding the night shot setting on their camera. Coming into focus. Oh, he looks like a corpse. <laughs> Mr. Turner, any reflections on the, the day? Um, no. No. You're feeling a little bit nervous about tomorrow and self-preservation. You've been talking to people about self-preservation. What's the words of wisdom there? Uh, the words of wisdom there are we need to try and avoid getting hit in the face by cold like we did today. We need to uh, therefore cover our faces a bit. Somebody's wearing a welder's mask, which is a great idea. Somebody was telling me tonight that she's going to be wearing a crash helmet which is also a good idea. We, of course, have no idea. So uh, we'll concoct some kind of mask tomorrow to wear around our faces to protect us from the wind and all the debris, a.k.a. crap, that's flying around in the air. Hmm. Thank you, Mr. Turner. As usual, worrying about nothing. Next morning, all but two of the cars are still in the race and there's just one more day to go to the Mongolian border. Getting anxious to get out of the city, looking forward to Mongolia, um, not looking forward to sleeping on the ground. Um, I love driving out of the city. I love, the more remote the better for me, but um, if I had my way, there would be a Ritz in the middle of nowhere with uh, frette sheets champagne waiting after a, uh, a day well run. But alas, that is not the situation, and I am fully prepared to camp. Not happy about it, but prepared to do so. Can you talk to me a little bit about this morning's procedures? You just, I just want to watch this guy who's about to run off with my hat and goggles. Where is he? He's there, look. Uh, Thank you. We get a hero send-off 
And before we really get going, we plan to pause a few miles down the road to see some caves where I'm going to find one of the Australian teams. Car number 115 is the Holden. The Aussies, father and son, are here because the son read a magazine article about the great race. I rung Dad up there and then. I said, Dad, what are you doing in 2007? I don't know, son, why, he said. I said, well, how about we go for a drive? Yeah, OK, where are we going? And I said, peaking the Paris. Well, you know, being asked what you're going to do in uh, three years' time, being my age, it's, it's like asking somebody how long's a piece of string. Well, they've got their lucky mascots. Do they reckon they'll make it to Paris? Only time will tell, of course. Uh, we don't know what's out there. We know roughly. Um, but as they say, the, uh, the proof is in the eating. And uh, once we start the taste of it, then our opinion's going to be a lot, yeah. <laughs> a lot more accurate, I, I would imagine. Now for the caves we stopped to see at this place called Yungang. Pamela's already here. These caves have been here for about uh, 1,500 years. I gather from quickly reading the guidebook um, that uh, there's about uh, 45 caves, um, which are major caves, but um, 254 caves have actually been registered. And they were used um, in ancient times um, when Indian Buddhism began to, began to flourish here. And Buddhists used to use the grottos to, um, as places to worship and pray. I think that's Nicola, you're not allowed to film in there, there's a sign. There's a sign that says no filming, so the Aussies grab their camera and go straight in. That's the entrance to caves numbers one through to six, which we shall endeavour to uh, clamber around inside. This is inside of the second cave, and this one dates back to the mid to the late 400 BC. AD, AC, DC, AD, AD it is. Not overwhelmed by Chinese archaeology, Mick and Andrew wait for the show to really get started. And here they all come. We're on the road to Mongolia. The official book of the Peking to Paris is out now, published by Veloci at $29.99. Check out PekingParis.com for further information.